So, I am going to say that I'm not talking about mushrooms tonight. I will probably never talk about mushrooms because I do not want to be responsible for anybody eating mushrooms. <laughs> It could happen also if you're eating anything that you have foraged. It's the ones I'm going to talk to, you should not have a problem with, but some people are more sensitive than others. So if you decide you want to do this, I would suggest you start in moderation and just eat a small amount and not go ahead and gorge on them. But there are other plants that we think of as, oh, a plant that's not going to have any side effects on us. And then you find out that you're allergic to it. Or you may not think you're allergic to it. And just kind of keep eating. And the more you eat, the more it gets into your system. I don't know if any of you have heard of a really pretty well-known forager by the name of Sam Thayer. Yeah. He's written a few books. He's got another new book coming out soon, he keeps telling me. And um, he, would, he actually grew up here in Wausau. And as a kid, he would go out foraging and, and eat whatever he could find, whether or not he knew if it was good to eat, but it tasted good to eat. Can you spell his last name? T H A Y E R. But apparently, he also loved green bell peppers. And so, as a kid, he was helping someone out, and they offered to let him have some green bell peppers to eat. So, he ate them all day, and he got very <laughs> sick. So, part of it's moderation here. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is, unfortunately my plants are getting a little wilted. I had a meeting today, so I had to get out and pick them early. Sumac. This is basically considered a plant that basically the birds are going to go and eat the berries off of. Have any of you ever used sumac? And what did you use it for? We made lemonade. <laughs> lemonade, especially if you were a Girl Scout leader. We all made lemonade uh, for the kids. So you, what you do is you actually take these little berries. And the little berries, um, if they're picked early, like when they first start coming out, they will then have a milder taste. But as they get a little older, they're going to get to be more acidic. And when you make your lemonade, you're going to have to keep putting more and more and more sugar in it. So that basically takes care of my, my, um. Well, if I used to get a rash from sumac, was, I, was it common sumac or could it have been? I used to play in the woods and in the wet to, area. I used to get a rash and the doctor said it was sumac. It could have been, but there is also, this is the common sumac. There is another one that grows more in the wetlands, and it is very toxic, and it is basically called the poisonous sumac. When you make your tea, um, do you do it with, do you boil it, or do you make it from cold? You mean the lemonade? Mm -hmm. The lemonade, I tend to always put everything more or less in a boiling water first. Um, That's the way I always have, made it when I told somebody <laughs> told me I was doing it wrong, put it out in the sun. And it well, you, true. you could do that too, except. That's what I was the boiling address like insects? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to come up with a nice condition of that yeah. protein. <laughs> you know, it depends on what all you want in your lemonade, you know. But of course, you're going to rinse it numerous times before you you know, go ahead and try to make it as lemonade. Do you have any idea how many berries it takes if you're doing To make a lemonade? Yeah. I mean, is there like a whole bunch? Or you know, I thought similar? somebody was going to ask me that, and I thought, for some reason, I'm thinking that you pick these berries off 
and I think it's like a half of a cup mm. to like a quart. Mm. And they're going to be much milder in the early part of the season, <coughs> and they're going to get much stronger as you go along. So you're probably going to have to taste them to see how it how it tastes. Well, does and, it taste like lemonade? Or does it it does. Huh. And it's a very pretty pink color. Wow. So it's basically pink lemonade. I even canned it, yeah. the lemonade. Mm. Really? Mm. Mm. So the common sumac, is that the one that can grow really tall? No, they don't grow just that tall. Just They're kind of um, tall shrubs. Right. Mm. I would say maybe wow. seven to ten feet. Oh, okay, that seems tall. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not like a tree. Okay. When you say I, the early season, does that mean June, July? Early season is, you're going to watch for these. They're going to start out greenish. So when I'm referring to early, it's going to be when they start turning red. Mm -hmm. And of course, with anything you're going to be out there trying to forage, the squirrels, the deer, everybody's out there for competition. So you have to kind of keep checking daily to see how it's going. And are they easily distinguishable from the poison sumac? Yes. Good. The, <laughs> these, they, they grew in a somewhat wet area, but they tend to turn red. Poisonous ones don't. But they start out green. <laughs> And to tell you, I can tell you where they tend to want to grow. Um, they like to grow in a wet area or along ditches, along highways, yep. things like that. Which one? The common or the The poison? common. This okay. one. The other one is going to grow, when I say a wetland, I mean like really wet. Uh, standing mm -hmm. water. If you don't mind, um, you said highways. How do you feel about foraging on, on the roadside with all the fumes and tar and things? I would not do it. Okay. Really? Because you have no idea what's being sprayed on it. A lot of times along the highways they do spray. Mm -hmm. But that is a good question. And it's also going to get me into talking to you a tad about where, to for where you can forage and where you can be a nice person for it. Okay. So, you probably don't want to do it along highways, even along county roads. I wouldn't do it. So then what does that kind of leave you with? A farmer's field? Or a landowner that does not farm it? Or doesn't farm? But that landowner may be out there growing all this stuff for their own use. So it's very important that you ask the person if you want to go foraging on their land. Because in the state of Wisconsin, if you, if the land isn't posted, that doesn't mean that you can't get arrested for trespassing. You are still trespassing as long as you step on that person's property without being invited. Thank you. I see it. So, does that answer the question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I, I would avoid farmer's fields or anything along farmer's fields because they do tend to do a lot of spraying now. And some of these plants you may find growing not necessarily in the field, but along the fence lines, the borders between different properties, that too the spray can come off. So, has anyone ever gone uh, out picking nuts? Wild nuts. Okay. I was having an awful time today trying to beat the squirrels to my nuts. But I went out there over the weekend. There were quite a few. Today all I like find was kind of scrawny ones. So the first one, this is a hazelnut. And hazelnuts, um, they have this real pretty outside edge. Does anybody want me to pass it around? Sure. Yeah. 
and that would be a lease that goes with it. So I highly suggest if you're going to pick hazelnuts, you wear some type of a leather glove or something because it is going to be pricky. They're also difficult to crack open because you first have to take that husk off of it before you can actually crack the nut. But a hazelnut can be used just as though you were using a nut that you would go to the grocery store and buy. So they're a lot like uh, filberts, you know, those little brown things. This one here that I'm going to talk about used to be very common around Wisconsin, and it has, for some reason, it's declining rapidly. And what this one is, is a butternut. <clears throat> and you can use that in your baking or whatever, just like you use other nuts. If you want them to have a roasted flavor to them, just pop them in the oven for a little while to roast them. These, some little critter is really working on it. But um, they tend to have a, a more oily taste to it. So that's why they're called a butternut. A wild one because the butternut Yes, these are wild. Are those trees or shrubs? The butternut, hazelnut, big trees? They get to be about the size of an apple tree, but not nearly as wide. The next thing that I was going to talk to you is about. I was trying to pick things that I thought you might be somewhat familiar with. Is this one. And I bet you people are not going to have a clue what it is. Does everybody recognize it? Yeah. 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 If you want to pass around my like chin, otherwise, I'll just leave it sit here. It's kind of amazing. This is a very amazing plant. And what it is, it's sometimes referred to as nature's grocery store. Mm -hmm. There are many uses for cattails. And it, they tend to uh, grow very well in wet areas. So some of the things they can be used for is the flower heads, which would be this part, can, can be eaten in the spring. That's before they turn brown. The caution on cattails would be they look a lot like wild iris, which also will grow in the same area. And until they get big enough, they can easily be confused. Now, you can eat this just like a salad green or something. And it's nice and tender, not like now it's kind of stiff. But you wouldn't want to eat the wild iris because those leaves are poisonous. So you got to be very careful on making sure that you know one from the other. There are two different types of cattails. There's the narrow leaf cattail, which is what this one is. And then there's the wide leaf. And for purposes of eating them, they're pretty much both the same. Because I, I put a bag on this because I had to go out and dig it out of the What would you do with the flower head as far as eating it? The, oh, it can be. Um, when it's still green, it's going to be kind of like a little green sausage or something. So you could saute it or put it into a stir fry, things like that. You can eat and eat the stems. You kind of have to peel all this stuff off of them. And then you can eat that also. But the coolest part that I think is... You can eat the roots of cattails. 
and they're very starchy. So long before we had grocery stores and things like that, our, the early settlers, including the Native Americans, they had to forage for everything. And they would use the roots, just like we use potatoes. So you can kind of peel it off, boil it up, mash it, whatever you want to do. And in the early spring, it's going to have more of a potato taste to it. So, and if that's all you've eaten and not had tasted a potato, you're going to think it's good. It's going to taste just like a potato. <laughs> and they tend to grow in very wet, swampy type areas. With usually some standing water in it. So the caution with any of that foraging for cattails would be the parasites that could be in the water. So you're going to want to really wash it very well. And if you're going to eat the stalks, you may want to boil it, you know, parboil it at least. So um, the potato, in that's like a potato, you're going to be kind of peeling it. So, you know, as far as scrubbing and washing, it's not going to be as bad because you're going to be peeling it. So it's like a potato. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's going to be good. So this is, I don't know if you can see that. I mean, they're not going to be fat and round like a potato, but right after the flower here starts, what's going to, um, you're going to get the pollen on it. And the pollen is yellow. And you can go ahead and take that pollen and shake it off into a bowl or a cup or whatever. And you can use it just like you would use a coloring. So if you're making a cake, you want to put some into the batter, it's going to make your cake yellow. And basically what that is, it is basically a fine little powder on it. Did you say that that's in the spring when you would eat that? that? Correct. In the early spring, are they doing our early start? Well, you're going to have to kind of keep an eye on them to know what stage they're at. Just like everything in Wisconsin, you know, we might have an early spring, we might have a later spring. Anybody's got any other questions? Otherwise, I think I'm going to run out of sample. I may have missed it. What does the flower taste like when it's green? The flower? Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of, you usually can make it like into a fritter or something to fry it or put it into a stir fry. I think, I would say it kind of has more of a taste that's going to taste kind of like broccoli. Mm -hmm. Some people don't like that. <laughs> so, then, so then, you know, if I think people are going to like broccoli, I may say it'll taste like sugar candy or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. This one, I was so proud because I had gotten one with a flower, but um, we're all going to know this guy, the dandelion. I'm sure at one point everybody's seen some in somebody's room. But now, the dandelion. The dandelion is a plant that you can use multiple parts of this plant. So like in the early spring, you may want to pick some of the young tender leaves and you can use them in a salad, either raw or you can cook them. The one, what I like to do is actually go ahead and fry up some bacon, throw a little onion in, and then do it like a wilted salad over the dandelion. As they start getting older, they will tend to 
get tougher and more bitter. So this one here, when I picked it, the leaves are, are still new and young, but oh well. The flower can be used as a garnish in food. And you can also make wine out of the flowers. So you pick the flower heads and you make sure that you take all of the little green thing off that's here. You just pull these things out and you're gonna need like at least a cup of these. And so what you would put on there also to make wine would be, usually it's lemons and oranges that they put into it. And then a lot of sugar. And then you gotta just kind of leave it sit there and ferment. Do it the same. Now, many years ago, there are a lot of old farmsteads that you will still see out there driving around. And you may see some old orchards. And in these old orchards, they may have been nice, beautiful apples like the ones that you buy at the grocery store or the farmer's market or whatever. But left unfertilized and untended to, they tend to revert back to their native state. And that doesn't mean that they're not good. They're, they're a lot smaller. They're a little tart sometimes really tart, but they're very, very flavorful. They make the best applesauce, if you're into making applesauce. They be, they're a hard apple, and so because of that, you know, it's going to take a long time to cook them down and whatever. But you're going to usually, anyway, I do with these, get very white applesauce. It's not the pinkish color or the brownish color, it's white. And at this point, you can eat them and they will be relatively sweet. They're gonna be a, have a very strong apple taste to them, but, you know, my little grandson, he, he sits there and eats some green and it's like, <clears throat> and he thinks they're pretty cool. Let's go to grandma's <laughs> house. So, has anybody ever found fields or old orchards and considered picking the apples? The other thing I did bring in, I was up to my farm up where I grew up, and I uh, picked a very few plums because there was very few up there. And there were so, such a small quantity that I put them in a little plastic bag. And, and the other day, I'm driving home from work, and it's like, I wonder what I ever did with those plums. I don't remember taking them in the house. So maybe it was when I was going to work. Well, I found out when I was driving home. <laughs> because my whole vehicle smells like plums. <laughs> so they ripened. And the wild plums have a tendency to be very sweet inside when they're ripe, but they have a very bitter skin. So, you know, they're kind of fun to eat. You bite into them and you suck out the innards and spit out the skin. So I'm sure that everybody is familiar with marsh marigolds, or better, sometimes known as cowslips. Oh, okay. I, I don't have a sample because they're in the spring. But they'll have roundish leaves like about this. And when I tell you where you're going to see them, you're going to go, oh, yeah. They grow in wet areas. But you only see them in the spring. So when you're driving along and there's all these yellow flowers out there, that's going to be the marsh marigolds or cowslips. 
and they, they tend to grow to be anywhere between three and seven inches tall. But it's going to be this huge mass. <clears throat> kind of like now when you drive around and all you see in all the fields is goldenrod. But that's kind of how it looks in all the wet areas. But with <coughs> the marsh marigolds, you can actually take and pick the leaves when they're quite small. And the stems will have this papery film on it. And you want to take this papery film off. And it's kind of time consuming. But then you can put it into salads or whatever you want to use it for, stir fries, whatever. It's going to taste more along the line of spinach. And it will tend to be a little spicy. Is that the leaf that you eat? You eat the leaf or the stem? Both. Oh, both. The stems you're going to want to, if, you know, if you're going to put those in, you're going to want to somehow cook them because they're eh, maybe the size of my little finger or something, you know. They're not real thick, but they're not real thin. And they'd be, they're a little tougher than the leaves are. It's sort of like arugula, you're saying? It's spicy like that? I'm sorry? Like arugula. Um, Is it pepper? Like a mild arugula. Okay, so it's like pepper. Mild I personally am not a big fan of arugula. I think it's a little too spicy for me. Then... I'm sorry, could you cook the leaves too? You can. If, so you might want to just saute them, but I would cook the, the stems first okay. and, then, and then the leaves. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the flowers, you can always pick the flowers for garnish on your salads. Is there edible also? I'm not sure if they're edible, but they're pretty <laughs> on your salad around the outside edge. <laughs> There again, you know, it's different for each person. Some people are, might be allergic to it, some may not. Then, uh, I think I'm missing a plant here. Okay, plant I was going to talk about, and you just probably all would recognize it anyway is um, is evening primrose. They tend to grow in a like old fields, that type of thing. They have yellow flowers on them. And with evening primrose, they happen to be a biennial plant. They're not an annual or perennial. Most of these other plants, I guess I would consider as perennials. But with the evening primrose being that it's a biennial, the root you can eat raw. If you dig it out, you can eat the root. It's spicy. It's a very spicy little root. But um, some people like the taste of that spiciness, and some of them don't. And by spicy, what I'm going to say is it's more like a hot, peppery, spicy. Not like cinnamon or nutmeg or something like that. It's like that type of spicy. The leaves, you can go ahead and eat also. And you want to make sure that you don't um, take too many leaves off at one time because evening primrose will grow like one here or one over there and you got to be careful when you're out foraging not to take a lot so if you're out foraging it's not like going to your garden and it's like okay I'm going to take a half a row you need to make sure that you kind of pick and choose and just take some from here some from there so that there will be some left for next year and the year after and the year after. You know, the, the one problem 
that I can think of that comes to mind right now of where people are going out and picking way too many of them, and we're going to be losing them, I'm afraid, at some point, is ramps <coughs> or leaks, whichever way you want to call them. And they've been around forever, and nobody really cared about them. But for whatever reason, they have now become the big thing to eat. So you're going to hear a lot about ramps. Oh, I want ramps, ramps. And they only grow to be about that tall. And does everybody know what ramps are? Yeah. <coughs> they, they're like wild onions. So people will, will go out there and pick them and make soup out of them or, or put them in their salad or put them here and put them there and put them everywhere. And because they grow closely together, and so you may find a bunch here, but you might have to walk two blocks to find the next bunch. If people continue to keep taking the stuff, they are going to be gone. Mm -hmm. And when wild plants are gone, they don't come back. Unless somehow some seed comes over or something. But it's not like you're going to run to the, to the garden center and buy a package of milkweeds or whatever. So that's one thing you got to be very careful and be nice to nature about and just take what you're going to use and if it's only a small lunch you're going to just want to take enough for a taste. So so you were going to say about the leaves? On the primrose? Yes. Oh I'm sorry. The, the leaves tend to um, be a little spicy, not quite as spicy as the root, but you're going to want to take the leaves on the second year of the plant. And then you're just going to take them like once or something because, and you're not going to want to take all the leaves off this poor plant because it's going to, it's not as tall as say a milkweed, but it's going to have leaves that are smaller than that. But it may be only this tall, and so if you take all the leaves off of it, you're going to maybe have a dozen leaves. So you have to be careful about it. Would you use those raw cooked or? You can use it in salad or whatever you want. Any of these that I talk about the leaves or whatever and say you can use in salad, you can also do a stir fry or make a salad that's that would be like, um, say put bacon and olive oil and salt and pepper on it or something. And so it's been considered a wilted salad. And most of them, to a lot of people, they don't really notice that they're eating anything wild then. They're going to think that, oh, kind of tastes like spinach. A lot of them taste like spinach. But if they're spicy, they're going to have a little zing to it, so it's going to be zingy spinach. <laughs> then the other thing, I'm sure everybody has seen one of these little things out going out in the woods, or out in the fields, I should say. And people actually eat these. But it's also the host plant to monarch butterflies. So. Be very, uh, if you wanted to try them, go ahead, but make sure you leave enough for the monarchs. So, with the milkweed, you can cook these pods that they have. The reason I brought two is because here are the pods for this little one. And these are the pods when they get bigger. When you want to cook them, you could fry or saute the, the pods, but you want to use the small ones. And they're perfectly fine to eat until they get full grown. And when they get to be full grown, are at that stage. 
but they're going to get where instead of having white seeds inside of them, and this is what the milk, um, the milkweed things that fly around in the fall are the seed from the seed pod. Milkweeds, this is a whole different presentation here. <laughs> the milkweeds are, are very good medicinally also. It's a very good medicinal plant. And what the medicinal part of it is, is this white sappy stuff on it that comes out. And it's especially helpful if you have warts. Mm -hmm. And you can just put it on your wart, and before you know it, your wart is just going to kind of dry up. I haven't tried it on moles, and somebody asked me if it would work on skin tags. I don't think so. I don't know. What is the monarch? Does the monarch eat the moles? The monarchs eat the leaves, and they lay their eggs on the back of the leaf and then they hatch into the caterpillars and then they eat the leaves. But you're saying no, but, but here's what I'm going to tell you this. The not the same as a wart. Oh, you mean just as far as the yeah. mole? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when I was a kid, I had a lot of warts all over my hands. And one day my dad says to me, he says, I'm probably like 12 years old. I went to a little one room country school. What can I say, you know? And I was related to all the boys there, so. <laughs> but my dad says, you know, you gotta do something about those warts, because no boy is ever gonna wanna hold your hand. And I was like, really? So, my mother, who, had a Native American friend that used to come over a lot. And she lived up on the reservation up there. And she told my mom, she said, well, have her put milkweed on it. So here I'm out, running around, dotting myself with milkweeds. And you know what? Before I knew it, they dried up and they were gone. And I didn't even realize that they were drying up or anything. It was like one day all of a sudden I looked and I didn't have any. They've never come back. So I don't know if there's something in this guy. So I was going to open this so that you guys can see what these seeds look like. So can you plant those seeds and have them? Sure. I think you could. In trouble. Yes, they are. They're in big trouble. You know there was a big, um, mm -hmm. better be careful. Oh well, this isn't the library I work at. <laughs> well, a milkweed thing is flying around. Yeah. But this is what they, they're going to look like on the inside. And you're probably <clears throat> familiar with these things floating through the air. And when they get to that stage where they're going to open up, these are going to become dry and hard. And some people pick them for fall decorations, things like that, the pots. But when these things start turning brown, these little seeds, then they become poisonous. So you're not going to want to, to continue to eat them. So. I mean, if you were to scatter some seeds around and try and just let some grow wherever, do they prefer wetter soil, drier, sandy, clay, anywhere? I'm not sure that milkweed are really particular because where I live, it's wet, and I have wetland, and I have hills that are drier, and they seem to grow everywhere. I've taken them from like a wet area and put them in my flower garden and they took really well. There are a lot of them around this year too. We've had like four blow into the yard um, from nowhere and our yard is not particularly wet. 
because they usually didn't they used to grow a lot roadside yeah. in yes. Wisconsin and they've sort they've declined because they cut those all down. Correct. You can still see them, especially when you're out in the country, um, and they don't mow the grass very often. <laughs> I'm still waiting for my first mowing this year. What can I say? Yeah. Um, so do you eat the outside pod as well or just the inside? When they're young, you would just cook the outside. And, and you eat the seeds in that inside. But once they start getting a little brownish, you're going to want to make sure. I would just open one up to see. And if they're starting to get brown, I would eat them. Do you also eat the leaves? Yes. Um, Does that apply only to the common milkweed, or could you eat the pods of other? I'm. These are basically the common milkweed, and the reason I, I'm sticking to things that people are going to see, you know, if you haven't been out foraging or what, if it's new to you, I wanted you to at least have a idea of what the plant is going to look like. Now with the milkweed, it tends to taste a lot like asparagus. <laughs> Have you tried eating milkweed? I'm not referring okay. I'm not referring to the pods. Yeah. But you can eat the stem of it and the leaves. Mm -hmm. And since I'm really a big advocate for the monarch butterflies, please try one or two little pods off of it and then leave it for the butterflies. Because they, they had a rough winter down there. In fact, there was a, a, a big storm and they lost 40%? 40%? So we got to be nice to them. They were going downhill to start with, and now they're really downhill. In fact, I usually have a lot, and I've had very few this year. So, anybody have any questions? <laughs> well, I just wanted to add something about the dandelions. I have made dandelion root coffee, and it is delicious. Yes, you, I forgot to you tell clean you that. that and you dry it and then you roast it roast and it. grind it up and it is better than coffee yes. and it's a very good liver cleanse. When you say roast it, tell tell us about that. How you well, I the, I use my toaster oven because you know I usually don't have huge amounts and I don't want to start a whole oven up. and I gotta watch it. Especially if I grind it first, Couple because minutes, yeah, you gotta watch it because it will get dark real fast. But you want it a little dark for that taste, you know, that not burnt, but you want <laughs> what part of the dandelion? Hmm? The, the roast. Like four hundred or? Um, I think it's better to start a little less, then you're not likely to burn it. I think. So. <laughs> I think 350, 375. Yeah. Um, I think with any of the roots, if you're going to roast them or anything you're roasting, you're going to just kind of have to keep an eye on it because it's kind of going to be like cooking <coughs> meat or something. You know, it's going to depend on how thick it is or whatever. So you're going to kind of have to keep an eye on all of them. Do you grind it before or after? You I've done both. And when it's ground, you really gotta watch it because then, like, oh, it is really tasty. See, I've never ground them first. I I've always, done both. Do you use your coffee grinder? Um, Vitamix. Oh, okay. But coffee grinder would work too. I bought a coffee grinder just, um, just for my or for my foraging. I do have a couple of antique ones, and I originally thought, oh, that's what I was gonna use. And it's like, no, I'm not gonna use. Anybody else have a question or the stem on the milkweed? Did you do that raw, cooks, peel it? I haven't I haven't finished my milkweed oh. <laughs> But I'm gonna skip that part, so if I don't go back to it, ooh, holler. When you were talking about um, coffee out of um, 
the roots. Is anybody, do you recognize the flower chicory that grows along the highways? Towards fall, beautiful blue flowers along there. Did you know that during the war and years prior, when there was no coffee, they would roast the roots of chicory and grind them? Yeah. Yeah. And in the south, they still do chicory. I've heard of it as a way of getting off coffee, to mix it with your coffee and then go more and more chicory. I could see that. I'm not too big of a coffee drinker, so. <laughs> And going back to the apples and the plums, and then I go back to the milkweed. Um, I like to actually put these just in the freezer and freeze them. And then in the winter time, I can put them in with my ice water. It's a, you know, it's, it's a cheap version of flavored water, but I think it's really good. And I tend to put blackberries in, blueberries in, anything I have around. So, going back to the milkweed, this poor milkweed here. Um, when you do the, the pods, you're going to parboil them first. Sorry, I skipped that part. Uh, to kind of cook them a little bit, and then you can fry them, roast them, whatever. But always remember my precaution to use that, uh, those brown seeds. <laughs> um, the same thing with the leaves. If you, you can just pick the leaves, but do them when they're young. These are not young anymore. So when they're first kind of coming up and just boil them for a few minutes. And I always parboil all of mine because I never know what's living on it or <laughs> what was on it. Parboil, you just boil it for like a minute or two, not even a few seconds. Get the water boiling and then throw it in and then, then I usually take it out like after half a minute or something, throw it in with some ice water, ice cubes in a pan or something. Also, with um, milkweed, if you pick the wild, the, when they're first coming up in the spring and pick the stems, they not only taste like asparagus, they resemble asparagus. And they tend to grow by wild asparagus. So, I don't have any here, but does anybody have black walnut trees? Black walnuts, you can actually use them just like regular walnuts when um, they get ripe. Anybody have a garden? They're trying to grow anything by their black walnuts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think there's other things that won't grow there besides tomatoes, but they always set, talk about you can never get a tomato to grow by a black walnut. My daughter lives outside of Madison, and she has a black walnut tree in the back of her yard. And it's kind of funny because she has stairs that she's got an old house, and it's got the stairs that go up the side of the house. And every morning, she has a green, black walnut sitting on the step. And she finally put out my camera that I have, my outdoor camera. And it's a squirrel. It brings her a walnut every day. She takes the other one away. The next day, there's another walnut on the step. I think it's a peace offering or something. Because she's got a big dog, and the dog I got is back to the squirrel. <laughs> so maybe the squirrel's thinking, hmm. Okay, that's all the samples I have. Oh. I use that most of my time. 
Any questions? questions? Yeah. Besides um, like nuts and apples and things like that, it seems like most of the foraging is done during the springtime. Is there anything that's edible like midsummer to like this season now? Blackberries, raspberries. For like leaves and stems and roots and things like that, or is that mostly all uh, just? Them you want to pretty much do in the spring. The one thing I didn't talk about, and I usually talk about it in my medicinal one, um, but you can eat these. Do you know what basswood trees look like? Yeah. Or the leaves, the big heart-shaped leaves. Um, those leaves are edible. You know, How do you I get them though? <laughs> How do you get them? Because my basswood are tall. Well, mine are tall too, but they're also pretty far down. Oh, right. Find the other tree. They're growing all over oh. town here, even. Okay, mine are huge, so. They don't sucker. Because mm -hmm. my woods are kind of thick. Oh, okay. No wonder. Do I? No. There's yeah, they're kind of like a big heart shape. Yeah, yeah she wonders if they have a pot. There's no. So what are those? It's it's not yeah. a native plant. I don't believe. Yeah, I think those are good things. Yes. Where do you eat the basswood leaves? Like a salad or what? Yes. Palmer makes a good tea also. Exactly. Um, in the spring, they have these flowers that are. They come off the flowers like the end of a little branch type thing so it's not like attached right to the tree so you're going to have like a cute little umbrella or something and it has white flowers and they are so fragrant and they're very good smelling but people usually want the flowers and then they um, make a tea out of it and the tea is good for if you have indigestion it can also be used if you have like the flu or even a cold. My grandmother was from, from um, Austria and we had a big a basswood tree or linden tree as there. Depends where you're living, I think what you want to call it. And so we always had to pick grocery bags full of them for her. Anybody else? Yes. I, got a, I came in a little bit late. Did you talk about the sumac? I did. And is that Do you want to hear about the sumac? If you don't mind. <laughs> this is um, the common, mm -hmm. the one that you're normally going to see. And it makes wonderful lemonade. It's a pink lemonade. But it's only if you pick these, they're called berries, but they're very small little things on there. And you need to pick those about now, or even last week, and um, you just go and put them in water and leave them steep for a while, and then add sugar, and you have a beautiful pink lemonade. So anybody welcome to come up here and look at these plants. Question. Anybody have any more questions? Yes. Are there any other plants you'd suggest for making teas? Oh, there's so, so many. <laughs> um, chamomile, wild chamomile. Um, Mints. Mints. Out of the ordinary. I mean, you see that in, in tea bags. So. Yes. Um, out of the ordinary. <clears throat> Elderberries. Yeah. Elderberries are very hard to come by. Mm -hmm. Raspberry leaves. The cat birds love my elderberries, and they clean a bush faster than you can blink. The berries or the leaves are the what you use for the tea. The berries, or the flowers, the flowers and the berries. Can you make dandelion tea? Yes. I don't see why not. You can make wine. You can make elderberry wine. The leaves are too rare, a liver cleanse. Uh, what else could be used for teas? I don't so much have the tea thing, but uh, something that can be eaten this time of the year, that if you can find it, are day lilies. Yes. The yeah. lily, just before it blossoms, when the pot, the bud, mm -hmm. it is sort of like green and orange on the outside, 
pick it before it blossoms, and it tastes, I mean, you can't, if you had your eyes shut, you wouldn't know if you're eating asparagus or you're eating a day early. Then if you pick the flower when it's fully bloomed, and you saute it just a little bit, it, it looks really nice on the plate that you're having like pork and rice and it's all white and gray. <laughs> the daylily tastes good and looks good on the plate. But if you cook it a little bit longer, it turns just as pale as everything else. Did you ever do the root? I've never done the root. Uh, the hard part with the daylily is when you, where I used to find them, they used to mold, the town did, and then they started spraying them. Yeah. Them. yeah. I agree with that. You can come to my house, I've got a bazillion of them. <laughs> if the word gets out about how good they are, there are going to be people sneaking in your bag. Yeah? Well, we eat them raw, the flowers oh, raw, and they got a peppery yeah. taste. Yeah. They're wonderful raw, but cooked, they're just wonderful. I've never eaten daylily flowers, but I've eaten squash flowers. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you stuff them with cream cheese and all that stuff. Could you, do you think you could do a daylily flower by stuffing it with cream cheese? I don't know why not, but they're really quite delicate. I, I've never tried it with the squash. I'd rather have the squash than the flower. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Are daylilies, is that the orange lily? Or is that the when, yeah. they, when they start growing wild, they're invasive. They're not, they're not a cute little flower. I mean, they just, they, everything that was growing there is gone. It's just daily. The roots are really good. They're like, they are. They are. Yeah. Are they the orange, the lilies and the orange? Okay. Okay. Other questions? Do I have other, any other questions? I do. Chad? Hmm? Yes. I, quick question, and it may be stupid. Um, when you were saying that apples are... Wait, she's not... Plantain. You can, you can actually eat them, but I think their better use is for medicinal purposes. So if you get a bee sting, a cut, sure. anything, just break off the plantain leaf, but make sure it's a younger one. And the little sap that's in it is what you want to use. Hmm. You have a question.